So far, we've done an almighty five verses of John's Gospel. So um, we're looking at verse 6 to 18 today. But just to set it in context, I'm going to read verses 1 to 18. So it's from the start of John 1 to 18. And uh, just notice, John's building this character from verse 1 on, onwards, this character called the Word. Um, the Word was with God, alongside God, but also the Word was God. So John's building this character, and we're going to continue looking at that character today. So um, John chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a, to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all those who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave, he, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor human decision, nor or husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This one I spoke about when I said, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. <clears throat> Amen. So let's uh, <clears throat> go on to look at that passage now, particularly verses 6 uh, to 18. So let me just pray now as we begin. <clears throat> Lord, we do thank you for today. We thank you as we just sang that although we were once your enemies, <clears throat> if, we've trust, <clears throat> if we've trusted in this this word, this light, this life, this Jesus, um, then we are now seated at your table in the closest relationship um, with you as we, we possibly can. Uh, Lord, we thank you um, that through belief and trust in Jesus, that as it says here, that we have become, got the right to become children of God. And so Lord, we pray that we'll believe in this Jesus today. I pray that everyone here would see that we need to make a response to Jesus as we leave here today, each and every one of us will either be rejecting him or accepting him. And Lord, I pray that perhaps there's someone here for the first time would accept Jesus, that today will be the day of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, so there should be a PowerPoint that comes up uh, as well. And as mentioned, so th far throughout John, if you've been here in the evening services, throughout chapter one so far, John's been building this character for us. He's been called, so far, if you look at chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, so far he, this character's been called the words. He was with God, but also was God. He's been called the light. He's been called the life. Verse 3, he's been called the creator of all things. But this person that John is talking about has yet to be named, hasn't he? We're not actually given his name yet, and it's only when we get to verse 17 do we see who his name is? And it's Jesus Christ. And so this character, if you've been here uh, throughout the series in the evenings, or this is the first time you've, you, you've heard about this because you haven't, you haven't heard about the John series, what John is trying to get you to think about is what is your response to this word, this life, this light, this Jesus? What's your response? What do you think of him? Because whether you've been going to church your whole life or perhaps if today's your first time you've ever set foot in church, it's still true. At the end of the day, there are only two responses you can make to Jesus. You might think, well, I don't reject him or, or accept him, I'm just leaving him. Well, that is rejecting him. So whether you are 8 or 80 or anywhere in between or even over that, I want you to think about today about your response to Jesus. Because when all is said and done, there are only two 
responses, to receive him or to reject him. Again, if you were here in the evening a couple of weeks ago, we saw verse 5, didn't we? That the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And we saw that there, that the darkness, the darkness of sin and Satan that we see in the world, the darkness is not going to win. That Jesus, this light of the world, will be the one that wins. And so, what are you going to do? Are you going to walk in the light as he is in the light, or will you remain in darkness this morning? That's the two choices. To receive the light, to accept Jesus, or to remain in darkness, reject Jesus. And I've got three headings this morning just to help ourselves going through the passage. And the first heading is, is, is pretty much that, rejection or acceptance, because that's what we see in verses 6 to 13. As I said a couple of weeks ago in the evening, uh, Sunday church, whether it's morning or evening, Sunday is one of the greatest privileges you will ever have in your life. You might not think it, but it's true. Church is one of the greatest privileges you will have in your life, but it's also a place of great danger as well. It's a great privilege because whoever's standing up here to teach, if they're faithfully doing their job, you every week here will get to hear a message that is able to save you from your sin, the only message that's able to save. And that is a message where there is still two billion people in this world that have no access to it, and you get to hear it this morning. That's a great privilege. But it also means it puts you in a position of great danger. Because this morning and every Sunday, you will be presented with a Jesus. And when he is put before you, you need to do something about it. So what will you do with him? Or you reject him, and if you reject him, that is a far more serious offence than you think it is. But if you receive Jesus, if you have received Jesus, that is far more of a miracle than you can ever imagine. If you look down at verse 6, we're told about another character, aren't we? It's not Jesus. We're told about verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And now this isn't John, the author of the book, the Apostle John. We know it's John the Baptist, don't we? And so if you look at verses 6 and 8, it says about what this this new character, John, what he came to do. Um, There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. And so from these opening verses of John's Gospel, we see these two characters, John and Jesus. John was only a pointer Jesus was the point. Uh, John was a speaker of words. Jesus is the word. John was like a flashlight. (laughs) Jesus is the light of the world. And so the point here, rejection or acceptance. Uh, Let's start, sadly, with the first one. Let's start with with rejection, because we see that in verses uh, 10 and 11, don't we? And look at that first phrase in verse 10. He was in the world. Remember who that is talking about from John's Gospel. He was in the world. This word who was with God at the very beginning, who is God, before there was a world, he was there. This one is in the world. That seems like someone we should be taking notice of. I mean, how excited would you be if someone famous was moved into Newtown, it was the talk of the town, it was in the County Times, they moved in to, um, to join the other famous celebrities on Milford Road. But um, you could go there and see them, knock on their door. But if you think about it, this word, the one who existed before the world, was now in the world. That should be a big deal. That seems like someone we should be paying attention to. And then if that's not amazing enough, we see something, something else. The next phrase in verse 10, the world was made through him. We've looked at this already in John's Gospel. Everything in the world was made by this Jesus. There's that famous quote, isn't it, by Abian um, Kuyper. There is not one square inch of the entire creation about which Jesus does not cry out, this is mine. When he was walking and talking on earth, he could have pointed at everything, the sea, the mountains, that I made that, I made that. He could have looked you in the eye and said, you exist because of me. 
The whole universe holds together because of the power of my word. You have breath in your lungs because of me. This is who's coming into the world. And yet, that next phrase, the world did not recognize him. I don't know if you remember when it was our former Queen's uh, Platinum Jubilee, and uh, the former Royal Protection Officer was being interviewed on TV. His name was Richard Griffin, and uh, he was reminiscing. He, he said, you know, can you tell us a memory about the Queen that you have? And he went on to talk about a picnic that they would regularly have at Balmoral Castle. Um, and after the picnic, um, she would like to go for the picnic, but she obviously needed her protection officer with her. And they would often go for a walk after the picnic. On one occasion, they bumped into two uh, hikers, and obviously the Queen being the Queen, she always stopped for a chat, um, and it was two American tourists on a walking holiday. And it was very clear from the very beginning of the conversation, they didn't realise they were in the presence of the Queen. Um, and after a bit of chit chat, um, they, they, they asked the Queen, oh, so where do you live? And she said, well, I live in London, but I have a holiday home just over the hill there. I've been coming up, up here off and on for about 80 years. And they thought, hold on, if you've been coming up here for about 80 years, surely you've met the Queen during that time. And as quick as a flash, she says, well, I haven't, but Richard here meets her quite regularly. And so before we knew it, the Queen's protection officer, Richard Griffin, these two American tourists had their arms around him, giving a camera to the Queen for them, let her to take a photo of them. One of the greatest ever reigning monarchs in front of their face, and they didn't recognise her. The Lord Jesus, he made the world, he was before the world, and now he's in the world, and the world didn't recognise him. He should have been treated, shouldn't he, with the greatest praise and worship, being given all the awards that human beings could give someone. And so what are you doing with Jesus? Is he anything special to you? Do you recognise who he is? And there's one more phrase then in verse 11, isn't there? He came to that which was his own. Which, in one way, it means that yet he became human, he became one of us. But more precisely, that means he became one of his own people. He went to the Jewish people. He was the Messiah they were waiting for. And then when he went to his own people, what happened then? The next phrase in verse 11 but his own did not receive him. I mean, think about some of the emotional pain that I'm sure many of you have had in your life, perhaps being betrayed by those closest to you, perhaps betrayed um, by a parent who rejects you, maybe a child who wants nothing to do with you, perhaps those that you've cried over and they've been forgotten by you. You've been forgotten by them. Or well, think of Jesus. He was the one that the earth was waiting for, that he was the Messiah. And when he arrived, they didn't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear him. Again, that might be you this morning. He came to his own people, and his own people rejected him. <clears throat> the Pharisees despised him, the, the scribes debated him, the Sadducees loathed him, the chief priests accused him, the disciples doubted him, Judas betrayed betrayed him. Peter denied him. Herod harassed him. Pilate washed his hands of him. The soldiers beat him, and then finally the Romans crucified him. He came to his own people, his own family, and they did not receive him. Are you doing that? Again, if you reject Jesus, even if you reject him this morning, that is a far more serious offence than you can ever imagine. But if you receive Jesus... You receive Jesus this morning, that is a greater miracle than you can possibly imagine. Because then we get to an amazing word in verse 12, yet, yet, yet to all who did receive him. And I know many of you here, and I praise God that there's so many of you this morning that have received him. And think about that miracle that has taken place in your life. And you might think, what, what, what miracle? Are you? I see miracles in Things like the Exodus, I see miracles when water comes out of a, a rock, I, I, I go to the New Testament, and during Jesus' ministry, I see him doing miracles, I go to Acts, and even there, I see miracles, and you might think, well, yeah, I would love to see a miracle in my life. If you want to see a miracle, 
even if you want to see a miracle this morning, you believe in Jesus, you receive Jesus, that is a miracle. That is a miracle. Uh, receiving Jesus here is, is John's kind of, another way of John kind of saying, believing in Jesus. That when you believe in Jesus, when you receive Jesus, what is it that you receive when you receive Jesus? Verse 12, you receive the privilege of becoming a child of God. And you don't become this child of God. You don't become a child of God because it's your birthright. That's very clear in verse 13, isn't it? Children born, not of natural descent, nor human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. It is not a birthright to be a child of God. It is a born-again right to be called a child of God. You know, some people say, you know, all people everywhere, we're all children of God. We're not all children of God. John's very deliberate here. Only because of Jesus can we be children of God. God has one son, the son of God. He has one son by nature. He has many, many children here this morning by adoption. You know, sometimes we talk about our rights. We say, oh, it's my right as a church member to do this. It's my right as a British citizen to do this. It's my right to do that. None of us here have the right to be a child of God. None of us. And so how do we get it? How do we receive this? Well, you need to be born again. And we'll see that later on in the book in John chapter 3. But the last four words there in verse um, 13 explains how we get to be this child of God. It says, but born of God. It's God's initiative. It's God's work. If you've received Jesus, that miracle in your life is greater than we ever think about. Yeah, God reached down. From eternity past, God reached down, gave you life, gave you faith, and has granted you the immense privilege, the greatest privilege you will ever have on earth of being the child of God. You know, people talk nonsense today about what do you identify as? It's only Christians that have the greatest privilege on earth that can say, I'm a child of God. So that's our first heading. Are you rejecting or are you accepting? The next heading we're going to go to is just uh, the word became flesh. It's very much verse 14, isn't it? You know, everything perhaps that we've looked at in verses 1 to 5 throughout the series potentially could be wrapped up in this wonderful single verse, verse 14. Um, some of you might have heard of, I think it was a Scottish pastor um, called Tom Torrance, and he, he, he was chaplain. He was a chaplain during the time of World War II. And it, interestingly, he said there was one question that the soldiers asked him in the foxholes, in the trenches, more than any other question. With, with bullets flying over their heads, with their lives on the line, not knowing what the next day might bring, he said there was one question the soldiers asked him more than any other question. And the question was, the soldiers asked him, is God really like Jesus? There's one soldier on a stretcher called Private Phillips, 19-year-old um, lads, and he was bleeding from his wounds, minutes to live. Phillips looked up at Torrance and asked, Padre, is God really like Jesus? Why? Why was it with bullets flying over their heads, their lives on the line, why was it they needed to know, is God like Jesus? Why did they need to know that question? Because if God is like Jesus, then ultimately everything's going to be okay. The darkness doesn't win. We saw in verses 1 and 2, before there was anything else, there was God with his words. And the word also could be called God's. We've talked in previous sermons what do words do? Yeah, the words communicate things. They reveal, they express things. And the word is the expression of God. Everything that God wants to say to you is wrapped up in this person called the word. And we see this word became flesh. The word is the Christmas baby, born of Mary, laid in a manger. Jesus is the word. Or maybe it's better to say, the, or maybe, sorry, 
Maybe it's better to say that Jesus is the word rather than the word was, is Jesus because Jesus didn't begin his existence in Mary's womb, did he? Uh, we'll see that again in a minute as well. But he always existed along with the Father and the Holy Spirit in this loving communion, union together. He has always been God's word. And so if you want to know what God is like, maybe that's why you're here today. You want to find out what God is like. Well, look at Jesus. Everything we see Jesus saying, everything we um, see Jesus doing, it's revealing God the Father. And so what kind of God do we have? We have a God who stoops down to our level, who loves us, who heals, who touches, teaches, suffers, and bleeds, bleeds and dies for us. Jesus shows us what this God is like. As a well-known English poet, Lord Byron, and he said, if God is not like Jesus, then God ought to be like Jesus. But God is exactly like Jesus, because Jesus is the word. Another author, Glenn Scrivener, you might have heard of, he puts it this way. He says, Jesus is God-sized, and God is Jesus-shaped. What he means by that is that God is entirely God-sized, Jesus is the creator of, of all creation. He's the one by which we're saved. He's the one that holds everything together, that's holding this building up right now. You simply, this morning, you cannot think too highly of Jesus. But also, Jesus is entirely, uh, God is entirely Jesus-shaped. What he means there is, any God we imagine, any God that we can think about who is not like Jesus, is not God. Any God we imagine that's not like Jesus is not God's. He's the explanation of God's, the Word made flesh. The eternal Son, think about this, the eternal Son became a man. A member of the Trinity that always existed for all eternity became a member of the human race. That is simply incredible. Think of a, a deep sea diver in that sense. You know, a deep sea diver would put on a, a wetsuit, would put on diving gear. Um, but when God descended, when Jesus descended, he didn't put on flesh like a wetsuit. He didn't borrow flesh or hide behind flesh. The word, Jesus became flesh, 100% human. And so when Private Phillips asked his army chaplain, Torrance, that question, is God really like Jesus? Torrance said this. He says, I assured him that God was exactly like Jesus, the only God there is, the God who had come to us in Jesus, shown his face to us and poured out his love to us as our saviour. As I prayed, I commended Private Phillips to the Lord Jesus. He passed away. Jesus became what we are, so we might become what he is, a child of God's. He entered our family, the human race, so we could enter his family as a child of God's. But thirdly, and finally, our last heading is the invisible God made visible. We see from these verses, you see verse 15, uh, John saying, this one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Jesus' ministry would supersede, would go past John the Baptist's ministry. Remember we said earlier, John the Baptist was a pointer, Jesus was the point. And so, uh, just as Jesus was before John, Jesus was before John, again verse 15, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Not only does Jesus surpass John the Baptist's ministry, Jesus surpassed everything that we've seen in the Old Testament before as well. That's what Ruth was reading from Hebrews, that he's the one sacrifice we need. That's what we see, verses 16 and 17. Out of his fullness, we have received grace in place of grace, already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Maybe there's, um, there's husbands here. Maybe if your wife's gone for the weekend or she's working in the evening and uh, you want to do your wife a favour, so you, you, you clean the house before she comes home. Uh, you put the, the mess away in the lounge uh, caused by the kids. Uh, you've done the dishes. You've hoovered. You've done something called dusting. Um, and then you get the finishing touches. And you put some nice candles on. And um, 
with the candles in the home, the home looks beautiful and it smells all girly. But, and your wife comes back. She says, isn't this amazing? Isn't this beautiful? Um, if Husbands, if you've done that, then top marks. I won't look at couples at this point. But those candles, they're, they're illuminating the house. They're bringing light to you. But I'm aware we're doing a fire drill and Dan's decor is here. But imagine you kept the candles on overnight. Don't do that. But imagine if you did. And then you open the curtains up the next day. And like this morning, a bright, sunny, beautiful day. You can look at those candles. They're, they're decorative. They smell good. But you hardly need those candles in the same way because they have been completely, they're not bad, but they've been completely surpassed by the rising sun. And so it is with Jesus, the sun. He has completely surpassed everything that we've seen in the Old Testament. The, the law and the, the covenant given through Moses. The law came through Moses, like those candles in that sense. The, the, the law was good, but we have something better than the law. We have something better than Moses. We have the word made flesh. This word who is full of grace and truth, we're told. We read there, don't we? Grace and truth came through Jesus. Sometimes, perhaps we meet someone, we think, oh, they're a very gracious person. Uh, perhaps uh, we meet someone, and we think, oh, they're a very truthful person. Maybe a gracious person could be kind of guilty of thinking, um, what do these people think of me? I really want to be liked by them. Uh, perhaps a truthful person, they might be guilty of, I don't care what you think of me, just as long as you see I'm right. So you kind of get those people, what do these people think of me? Or, I don't care what you think of me, I just want to be right. And there's dangers of both, isn't there? But Jesus was full of grace and he was full of truth. And we need him to be both, don't we? We need him, Jesus, to be all of grace, that he welcomed sinners, he welcomes you and me, he welcomed tax collectors and ate with them. He had compassion on the crowds when they were hungry. He welcomed little children to come and sit on his lap. He healed the lame, he healed the blind, he saved a criminal on the cross as he was himself dying. Jesus was full of grace, but he was also full of truth. He condemned many of the religious leaders of the day because they were hypocrites and liars. He actually talked about hell far more than he talked about heaven. And when he called people to be his disciples, they told, he told them, you must pick up your cross and follow me. He obeyed the law completely. He was full of truth. He was full of grace and truth, all grace, all truth, all the time. And it doesn't say he came to simply give us a give an, Give us an example of grace and truth. He doesn't say this is what being gracious looks like or truth. He came to save us in grace and truth. And just look at that last verse. We've already mentioned verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But verse 18, look down. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. And so John what he's been doing these first 18 verses here, he's been building and building this character from the start. The one who was the word, the light, the life, the one who's greater than Moses. John's been building and building, and as we said, it's not till verse 17 we've been given his name, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you might know that back then, in, in the, these ancient times, Jesus was a very, very common name. It's, it's not exactly common uh, today, perhaps there's some footballers called Jesus or things like that. But in Palestine in the first century, Jesus was certainly in the top ten, if not the top five, baby boy names. Uh, if you need to know baby boys' names in 2023, and most popular ones, Noah, Liam, Benjamin, and Oliver. There you go. But Mary and Joseph called him Jesus. The angel told him to call him Jesus. It was common. And if we think about back then, no one was praying in Jesus' name. No one was looking for salvation in someone called Jesus. No one sang songs about Jesus. No one sang songs like, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Jesus was an ordinary name. But think about the disciples. When they looked in Jesus' face, and just an ordinary first century Jewish face, 
the disciples could see something no other human being had seen before. The very face of God. And the one, that's the one of the miracle of the incarnation. God didn't conceal his glory in someone like Jesus, but he revealed his glory and finally in Jesus. If you remember Exodus uh, 33, you've got Moses there speaking with God and Moses asks God, show me your glory. And God responds with saying, you cannot see my face for no one can see me and live. Moses then saw something like a shadow of God's glory, didn't he? But in Jesus, we're able to see something greater than Moses ever saw. It says verse 18, no one has ever seen God. God is invisible. How do you see an invisible God? And John's saying, look, I'll tell you. Look at Jesus. When you see him, you see God. And remember, this is who we're going to be seeing as we go through John's gospel. And so this is where where we've been in John's gospel so far. There's only two responses to Jesus. To receive him, or you can reject him. With everything that we've looked at, with John building up this character, can you imagine walking away from this Jesus? Can you imagine walking away from this Jesus? The invisible God made visible. Walking away from this Jesus is a sin worse than you know. You're saying to the one who made you, who keeps you, who sustains you, you're saying to him, I don't need you. The one who made the world, the one who walks in the world, are you really saying this Jesus that we've been looking at is really not as interesting as someone like sports or hobbies or that relationship you want? Really? Are you really saying that? That is seriously foolish and that's a serious offence against God. But if you're a Christian here and you've received him, the miracle that's been done in your life is greater than you know. Um, From time to time, I guess, like me, you've known some parents who allow their kids to call them by their first name. Um, Sometimes the kids call their parents their first name. And I honestly don't get that. I don't understand it. Why would I want my kids to call me Lloyd? Any of you can call me Lloyd. They are the only ones that call me dad. I have the privilege of being their dad. If you've received Jesus, think about your privilege. Think of the privilege that you have that not everyone else has, that billions of people do not get to call God father, but you do. You get to call him your father, and he looks down upon you, and because of Jesus, he gives you the right to be called his child. To be perfectly honest, if this morning, if you don't trust Jesus, if you haven't been born again, you wish you will never be born at all. He became what we are, so we might be what he is, a child of God's. He entered our family, the human race, so we could join his family. So he came, you could be a child of God. So is that your story this morning? Is that your response to him? Please think about that. 